When asked to share <clears throat> my thoughts and perspectives on black preaching by one of the premier professors and practitioners of homiletics in the nation, I asked myself what could I possibly bring to the table in a discussion about preaching where the Academy of Preaching and Celebration is housed, where seminarians have access to both the African-American consultation on preaching and to Dr. Frank Thomas, one of the world's leading experts on preaching. It felt like I would be taking sand to the beach <laughs> to talk about preaching in the place where Dr. Thomas teaches preaching. Then after praying about the matter, God showed me that sharing what I have seen in seven decades when it comes to preaching in the context of the portion of the black religious experience that I have, that would be something that might be of value to some seminarian preparing herself for a life of service to the Church of Jesus Christ or preparing himself to pastor a people where preaching 48 to 50 times a year for 20 to 30 years seems like an impossible task. I want to talk to you, therefore, about what I have seen, what I have heard, and what and whom I have experienced in seven decades of being a part of being a product of and being a practitioner of black preaching in the context of the United States iteration of the North American Black Atlantic diaspora. In trying to frame my presentation and in trying to condense or summarize seven decades into a talk that is under 60 minutes, <laughs> I had to come to grips with my perspective on black preaching being shaped by the foundational formation of the School of Theology at Virginia Union University. My grandfather, whose churches I was carried to and whose churches I worshiped in from the time I was born and carried down south for holidays, for vacations, or for the summer, from infancy until I was in the seventh grade, and my maternal grandparents moved into our home in Philadelphia. My grandfather was a product of the School of Theology at Virginia Union University. My grandfather's perspective and his point of departure when it came to preaching in a country, not rural, country black church, was shaped by the peculiarity of what Cornell West calls the hybridity of diasporic African existence. My grandfather was a phenomenon. He was not let off of the plantation on which he was born until the age of 20. And at the age of 20, he had no education whatsoever. Born in Henderson, North Carolina, he was raised in a cultural climate with a long history of racist thought, racist teaching, and racist practices, a state where it had been against the law to teach an African to read. At the age of 20, he had never seen the inside of a school or book. But he started school at the age of 20 anyhow. He finished grammar school, high school, and college. <clears throat> at Virginia Union, he graduated from college, and he graduated from Virginia Union Seminary in 1902. His diploma hangs on my wall in my study. His perspective as a black preacher was forged in the flames of North Carolina racism and refined in the classrooms of northern white missionaries who came south to teach at the schools set up for the freedmen, hybridity. With two degrees, he chose to stay in the south to teach at a two-room school to give some other black boys and girls in Virginia an <laughs> education, an opportunity to go further than the farm, and a vision of what was possible when one used the mind God gave them and refused to be defined by others who saw them as less than human. He taught at a two-room school while pastoring the Gravel Hill Baptist Church in Surrey County, Virginia for 20 years, and then pastoring the Jerusalem Baptist Church in Temperanceville, Virginia, on the eastern shore of Virginia for another 15 years before moving, as I said, into our home in Philadelphia when I was in the seventh grade. The black preaching I heard in his churches was shaped by the experience of North Carolina racism 
grandson of an Africans who were enslaved, son of a black woman whose parent knew the whip of the overseer, and shaped also by northern missionaries who taught European and British culture as being synonymous with Christianity, mm -hmm. hybridity. The black preaching I heard from his children also had a Virginia Union University foundation. One of his sons, Dr. John Bennett Henderson, who pastored the Bank Street Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia, where Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor was a member and where Proctor's family still belongs. John Henderson graduated from Virginia Union University and earned his Master of Divinity from Oberlin, a school with a long track record of anti-slavery activity and the education of African Americans, complex hybridity. Pastoring in the segregated South, Norfolk, Virginia, not only my grandfather's son, his daughter, my mother, was a graduate of Virginia Union University. A preacher not called a preacher in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, or 70s because she was a woman called a minister, called a Women's Day speaker. <laughs> but a black preacher nevertheless. And an educator with one master's degree from the University of Chicago, a second master's from the University of Pennsylvania, and her terminal degree also from the University of Pennsylvania. A black preacher who knew racism up close and personal, but whose Virginia Union perspective combined with her rural Virginia upbringing gave her the foundation on which I stand. One sidebar, in fact, two sidebars. I started to do this at first. My mother taught me this. She said, I had a close friend who was a Catholic, we were neighbors, we grew up together, Vincent Richardson and I, and we were trying to understand each other's faith traditions. As a Roman Catholic, he couldn't eat fish on Friday, started crying at summer camp because they had hot dogs on Friday. <laughs> and he would come to my church and didn't understand people raising their hand. So to make us feel better, my mother told this story. She said, two little boys just like you decided the best way to learn each other's faith was to go to church with each other. So the Catholic said, you come to my church first. And then he explained genuflection. He explained Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He explained communion, the mass. This was pre-Vatican II, why only baptized Catholics could take the communion. Then he went to the Baptist church. And the Baptist kid was explaining to him why people kept interrupting the preacher. <laughs> Why they really weren't waving at anybody. And then when the preacher stood up to preach, he took off his watch. And the little Baptist boy didn't say anything, so his Catholic friend says, what does that mean? He said, not a damn thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, my mother, as a woman preacher, bless my life. When my second year of pastoring, my second year of pastoring, I think I might have told the ministers in training at, at uh, Eastern Star, but most of you were not there. I called home one Sunday afternoon after I had flunked. It was my first time flunking as a pastor. And my mother answered the phone. And I said, is daddy home? She said, no, he's in an afternoon service. I said, okay, I'll call him back. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, I, I, I need to talk to daddy. She said, what's wrong? Boy, you sound terrible. I said, I, I need to talk to you. Said, why, why, why you need to talk to daddy? You can't talk to me. I said, well, I need to talk to a preacher. She said, oh, it's going to be like that. Honey. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. I mean, I need to talk to one who preaches every Sunday. Uh, she said, well, I don't preach every Sunday, but my husband's a preacher, he preaches every Sunday, my brother's a preacher, he preaches every Sunday, my father was a preacher, what, what's, what, what's wrong? I said, Mommy, do you know what flunk is? She said, every preacher knows what flunk is. <laughs> she said, don't you remember I told you when I went to Charles Booth's church, what happened to me, flunk was on the same plane riding in first class. <laughs> 
when I got up that morning, he got up earlier. He was in the presidential suite of the hotel. He went to the church and waited on me at the pulpit. When I stood up to preach, he said, come here. <laughs> you remember that? I said, yes, ma'am. Of course, I said, what's wrong? I said, but see, daddy taught me. My father taught me. And we used to call each other every Saturday night. Are you ghost up mm -hmm. for, for tomorrow? And my father taught me, if the Holy Ghost don't meet you in the study, don't look for him in the pulpit. <laughs> He said, you, you're here, and they're talking about, help me, Holy Ghost, it's too late. He wanted to help me <laughs> last week. I said, well, I met, I met the Holy Ghost. I mean, we had this thing together. I thought it was uptight. I thought it was, and it flunked. And I, that's what's wrong. So my mother said to me, do you aspire to be a master at the craft of preaching? Be honest, be honest. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that is a noble aspiration. Don't ever give up on it and don't ever think you've made it. Mm -hmm. Amen. But while you continue to strive to be a master at your craft of preaching, please remember this. Every piece by a master is not a masterpiece. Ooh. Right, right, right. She said, you see the ones that made it to the museum. <laughs> You don't see the ones at home and in the attic. <laughs> she said, your members get to see the stuff at home. <laughs> but they love you, so don't worry about it. She said, who, who's, who's, Hank Aaron hadn't even hit 700. Babe Ruth, what, what was Babe Ruth's batting average? I forgot what it was, 360. She said, that means he struck out seven times. You're not gonna knock it out the park every time. That's the foundation, half I should say the foundation, because my father was also a graduate of Virginia Union University. My father earned a Bachelor of Theology, a Bachelor of Arts, and a Master of Divinity from Virginia Union. And he, his experiences growing up in the segregated south of Caroline County, Virginia, were blended with the missionary teachings of an HBCU also as he pastored the Grace Baptist Church of Germantown in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for 42 years. Thus, the black preaching I heard from the pulpit where my daddy served also became the framework through which I heard, I understood, I evaluated, I critiqued, I enjoyed, I endured, I accepted and or rejected black preaching 70 years of black preaching. In the first decade, from the age of three until the age of 13. And as I was preparing this time to be with you, it dawned on me that many of the names I'm gonna call you don't know. It's good that they're taping this so that you can study it, Google it, and find out who these persons are. Because our worlds are two different worlds, the black religious experience and the non-African American religious tradition. My exposure to and understanding of black preaching was in the context of my experiences in Philadelphia and Virginia from the age of three to the age of 13 with my dad's being a part then of the National Baptist Convention, the Lot Carey Convention, and the Hampton Ministers Conference, and my mom's being a part of the International Ministers Wives and Widows Association. They would drag me to all of those meetings. I heard my first non-seminary trained pastor at a National Baptist Convention in Philadelphia that will forever be a part of my ministry. I was talking with Dr. Thomas about it at my memory as we were preparing for this morning's class. The National Baptist Convention was meeting in Convention Hall in Philadelphia. And back in those days, they had wooden folding chairs and all the preachers wore straw hats. Some were flat tops, some parted down the middle. And C.L. Franklin preached on growing old in this land. C.L. Franklin never made it to seminary. C.L. Franklin spent 90, 95 seconds on growing old, what growing old was like. When you grow old, that that doesn't spread out, wears out. And that that doesn't wear out, falls out. <laughs> then he spent 90 seconds on in this land. And this was 1953, the year before the Supreme Court's ruling of desegregation. He talked about being segregated from the cradle through the cemetery. Segregated hospitals, segregated nurseries, segregated cemeteries.
come back 90 more seconds on growing old. 90 seconds on in this land. What was like in this land? The Scottsboro boys. It's over. About 18, 20 minutes into his sermon, he shifted gears. <laughs> and he said, but rum. <laughs> there is a land. <laughs> oh, Lord, <of> rum. <laughs> there is a land where we'll never When he hit the third never, Aretha, his daughter, stood up in that key and started singing, never grow old. Chairs were flying, hats were flying. <laughs> I stood there and wonder, and wonder. I expose you to an understanding of black preaching. I heard seminary trained black preachers in those formative years like John Malchus Ellison taught by the missionaries that you don't show any emotion in your preaching, never. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, whose dialectical method of preaching became a part of my staple that he used to teach me that drum that into my head, not in this first decade, but while I was at Virginia Union on trips back and forth from Richmond, Virginia, where he was the president, up to Philadelphia. He had me practicing his dialectical method. Antithesis, thesis, relevant question. Synthesis of three points answering the relevant question. Gardner C. Taylor, my father's close friend. Sandy Ray, Howard Thurman. My daddy's black road dog, J. Quentin Jackson, pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church. And my daddy's white friend, V. Carney Hargroves, pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Germantown, who used to come to our black congregation and preach. He was a white, white pastor. And he was my sister's and my direct contact to Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> we took our letters to Santa, to Dr. Hargrove, because we knew he was white and Santa was white. <laughs> and Daddy told us he knew Santa Claus personally. <laughs> I heard seminary trained preaching, and I heard non-seminary trained preaching in the same decade of my life. Down in St. John, my father, as I mentioned, from Caroline County, Virginia, St. John Baptist Church in Caroline County, Virginia, I heard Sunday afternoon preaching, Sunday afternoon services, 100 degrees, windows open, food smells coming through the window. This one man stood up and preached on the 23rd Psalm. He couldn't spell seminary. And he started off with the the first word in the Lord's 23rd Psalm, the. That's a definite article, <laughs> as opposed to an indefinite article. It's not a Lord, it's the Lord. Amen. And then he spent a few seconds on the Lord is. Then he came back for three more minutes on the Lord is my. <laughs> By the time he got down to surely goodness and mercy, you couldn't hear him. They were making more noise in the church mm -hmm. than he was in his preaching. Powerfully packed together theology from the folk, not theology from the seminary. In that same decade, from the, in the second decade, from the age of 14 to 24, my ex exposure to and understanding of black preaching was in the context of my daddy leaving the National Baptist Convention the year the man got killed in Kansas City and taking our church into the American Baptist Convention my graduating from Central High School in Philadelphia and going to Virginia Union in Richmond, my being a part of the sit-ins at Virginia Union University, where my white Christian friends who shared the Word of God with me from Richmond Polytechnic Institute, which is now Virginia Commonwealth University, were Christian friends in the context of a Christian college club, but calling me nigger in the context of the sit-ins. Mm -hmm. My two years in the United States Marine Corps, my four years in the United States Navy. <clears throat> I also heard a wide variety of black preaching in the second decade of my being a part of the black religious tradition. While a student at Virginia Union University, I heard Sam Proctor. I heard Alex B. James. I heard Howard Chubbs. I heard Paul Martin, who's now president of the American Baptist Seminary of the West. I heard Dr. E. D. McCrary, who was not only a THD, earned a doctorate, but taught undergraduate and seminary at Virginia Union and pastored in Virginia. Dr. Gordon Blaine Hancock, with his doctorate from Harvard University, who taught both of my parents and who taught black economics 
and taught Christians what he called the double duty dollar. Make your dollar do double duty. Stop earning your money and spend it in the white community. Spend it in the black community. Why do you spend your money in stores where you can't try on your clothes? Mm. This was in the 1930s, Dr. Joy. I heard his, pre in fact, his church was right around the corner from the campus in walking distance. And most of us who had no cars walked to his church on Sundays. His nephew, whom he also sent to Harvard University, he would have come into Richmond to preach also, Dr. Charles G. Adams, <laughs> Dr. Morris Wellington Lee, pastors of the Fifth Street Baptist Church and Fifth Baptist, because our choir, Virginia Union, would go to different churches to raise money, and I got to hear preaching from all of those Virginia Union pastors in the city of Richmond, Virginia, and surrounding townships. Got to hear Martin Luther King while in college. Got to hear Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Heard my friend and classmate, Charles, Reverend Charles Sherrod. Many of you only know his name as one of the founders of SNCC. While in the Marine Corps and the Navy, I heard the pastor of the one black Baptist church in Jacksonville, North Carolina, while stationed at Camp Lejeune, and I heard Reverend Richard C. Keller, a Virginia Union alum, and his friend Reverend Lacey Curry, when I was stationed at Great Lakes Naval Station. In the third decade, from the ages of 29, or 25 to 35, I heard yet another vast spectrum of black preaching as I lived in the Washington metropolitan area, and then moved in that same decade to Chicago, Illinois. I heard Houston G. Brooks at Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Rockville, the man who ordained me, and the father of Henry Brooks, professor at Colgate Rochester Divinity School and Andover Newton School of Theology. I heard Dr. D.E. King. Have any of you all ever heard D.E. King? I know from Chicago. D.E. King, Dr. D.E. King was an earned doctorate also. Uh, from Northern Baptist Seminary. And Dr. D.E. King, for those of you who never heard him, Dr. D.E. King was not a hooper. He was not excited. Dr. D.E. King had a flat, bland voice. He never raised his voice above this level right here. Now, the night I was introduced to him, I had gone to Clay Evans Church. I used to go to Clay Evans Church or First Church of Deliverance on Sunday nights especially in the early years of Trinity's development, our church was very, very cold. And I need to hear something mm -hmm. to get my fire burning. <laughs> so I go sit in the back pew of Fellowship Baptist Church. Clay Evans didn't know me from Adam's house cat. And I just wanted to hear him moan. <laughs> and Clay Evans broadcast, they have 30 minutes of music, then they start singing What a Fellowship, and. Consuelo York would give the sick list and introduce Pastor Evans, and he preached. Pastor Evans stood up, he said, I see D.E. King is here. Come on here, D.E. I'm going to let him preach tonight. Now, I wanted to leave. <laughs> First of all, I don't know D.E. King. Secondly, I came to hear you. But the way Fellowship Church was run and still is run, you don't get up and walk out after the music is finished. The ushers will fight you. <laughs> You said, sit, 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 sit back. So I was stuck. I was just stuck. And D.E. King, when he stood up, he didn't have a voice like Alan Buzak, like Frank Thomas. Like, he said, I want to preach tonight from Revelations. I said, he's got to be a scholar or a fool. <laughs> In Revelation, Jesus said, behold, I am he that was dead and am alive forevermore and have the keys. You know, before Jesus came, everybody who died went to hell. I said, he's, I said, he's a fool. <laughs> From the second sentence on, the man had me. He said, now by hell, I don't mean that lake of fire that y'all mean when you say hell. I'm talking about shale. Shale's like a waiting station, something like the Catholic purgatory, where souls went to wait until the day of resurrection. Jesus, when he died, he went to hell. But he didn't go to wait, he went to carry on a revival. <laughs> and while he was down there, he started preaching, and he had a vest with a chain across it, 
with about 25 keys on the end of the chain. And he pulled up his keychain. He said he took the first key and he opened up the grave of Abraham. <laughs> Abraham stood up wiping the cobwebs from his eyes and said, who are you? He said, I'm that city you were looking for. He took the second key and he opened up the key of Isaac. And I said, daddy, who is this? He said, don't you remember that wrestling match? You remember up on the mountain, the, the ram in the bushes? He's the one to put the ram there. He <laughs> took the third key and opened up Jacob. Jacob said, Daddy, Granddaddy, who is this? He said, you remember being down by the river, Jabbok? Yeah. That's who you was wrestling with. He walked through the Old Testament, mm -hmm. took three keys and opened up the graves of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> well, who is that? Remember the fourth one in the furnace? But by the time he got to that last key, he was leading all these folks to heaven. And folks at Fellowship were making so much noise. He had a PA system, you couldn't hear him. <laughs> D.E. King, a masterful homiletician. I got to hear D.E. King and subsequently had him at our church several times. Like, of course, I got to hear Clay Evans. I got to hear Milton Brunson. And I got to hear Dr. Harold Carter, yes. Mr. My, the ministry and the prayer tradition of black people. I got to hear Dr. Henry Mitchell. I got to hear Dr. Ella Mitchell. I heard Dr. Anthony Cordova Campbell. He taught preaching. Tony Campbell taught preaching at BU. And Tony Campbell cl coined classic phrases for preachers like this. He, sometimes you'll find yourself preaching a sermon that's so bad, you wish you would hurry up and end. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Dr. Walter Fluker. I heard Dr. Heisel Taylor. I heard Bishop John Richard Bryant, Dr. Prathia Hall Wynn, Dr. Brenda Piper Little, Dr. Carolyn Knight, Dr. Jacqueline Grant, doc, Dr. Reverend, she, didn't, she was started with us in our doctoral class, but when her husband got elected to the Episcopacy, she had to drop out of the class, Reverend Cecilia Williams Bryant, Bishop H.H. H. Brookins, Bishop McKinley Young, Dr. Yvonne Delk, Reverend Frederick G. Sampson. <laughs> Reverend Dr. James Allen Forbes, Dr. T. Garrett Benjamin, Dr. Cynthia Hale, Dr. John W. Kenny, Dr. Miles Jerome Jones, Dr. Allen Buzak. I heard black preaching and black preachers from the United States to the United Holy Church of America and the United Church of Christ. In the fourth degree of my life and ministry, my, from 36 to 46, I experienced the polarization around social issues Dr. Thomas mentioned in the introduction. I experienced that polarization at a much more intense level. From the division over the fight to end apartheid, black preachers who preached divestment like Charles Cobb, Ed Edmonds, and Ben Chavis, and black preachers who preached constructive engagement like my father's colleague, Dr. Leon Sullivan, Black preachers who were open and affirming, like Bishop Yvette Flunder, and black preachers who were radically, if not rabidly, against any notion of inclusivity without conversion from homosexuality to heterosexuality and heterosexism, like Bishop Charles Blake. And in that fourth decade, I heard Dr. Carolyn Knight, whom I mentioned, I heard T.L. Barrett. T.L. Barrett, one Good Friday at our church. T.L. Barrett was born in the Church of God in Christ, raised in the Church of God in Christ, became pastor of a Baptist church, changed it to the Church of Universal Awareness, is back now to Kojic. But T.L. Barrett, with no seminary education whatsoever, came to our church and gave us a seminary education with Good Friday on the word that we assigned him to preach. He preached, we gave him that word. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And with no seminary education, T.L. Barrett said, let me help somebody here who's been wondering how Jesus could say to a thief or to a malefactor, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. And then Sunday morning, he's read Mary sees him, Martha sees him, Peter sees him, Andrew sees him, the 12 see him, then 500 more see him. How, how that contradiction? He, he said, it's not a contradiction. He said, in the Greek, ask these seminary graduates, they'll tell you, in the Greek, there's no punctuation. There are no commas, periods, and quotes. And we're used to seeing the English translation which says, verily, verily, I say unto you, comma, quotation mark. Today, 
you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> Period, close quote. He said, that's not in the Greek, look at the Greek. Ain't no comma, quote. So look at it carefully and you'll see Jesus is saying, verily, verily, I say unto you today, you gonna be with me in paradise. <laughs> when so never I get there. <laughs> I'm saying it to you today. <laughs> Not today you're going to be, no, whenever I get there, you're going to be there. <laughs> As I mentioned, Clarence Cobb, Metropolitan Spiritual Churches of America, Reverend Logan Kearse, his, his son in the ministry, Dr. Henry Harding, Reverend Lacey, Lacey Banks. Lacey Banks, Lacey Banks was one of those preachers that those of you who spent all this time in seminary grew to hate very quickly. Lacey Banks hadn't been anywhere near seminary but he was a journalist and he had a facility with words that the wordsmiths today would just kill for. And Lacey Banks could put together imageries in his messages that were just awesome. Like the seven last words, it is finished. Jesus took a checklist to heaven and started checking off the stuff that he had done in his ministry. Lacey Banks was a sports editor for one of the Chicago newspaper, powerful preacher, Dr. Jerry Cannon, Dr. Katie Cannon, his sister, Dr. Robert M. Birkins, Dr. Thomas Hoyt. I heard Dr. Walter Scott Thomas. I heard Dr. William Augustus Jones. I heard Reverend then, now Bishop Vashti McKenzie. I heard Dr. Susan Johnson Cook. I heard Dr. Claudette Copeland. <coughs> I heard Dr. Johnny Coleman. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Reverend Dr. Ann Leitner Fuller. Reverend Frederick Douglas Haynes, Bishop Rudolph McKissick, Dr. William Curtis, Dr. Earl Mason, Dr. Marcus Cosby, Dr. Lance Watson, Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. Now, those of you who know him as a professor and know him as one of the greatest preachers in the country did not know him when he was in seminary and we had a sleep in at his house. <laughs> he kept us up all night. We tried to get some sleep on the sofa, bed bags and blankets. Here comes Frank. You know, one day I'm gonna preach a sermon on the woman that... <laughs> Five minutes later. One day, one day I'm gonna preach a sermon on the Syrophoenician. Frank, we're trying to get some sleep. <laughs> I heard and watched develop one of the most powerful voices in North America. Reverend Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas. I heard Dr. Faris, Teresa Fry Brown, Dr. Deborah Grant, Jackie Grant's sister, Dr. Wilma Johnson, Dr. Vincent Harding. His family asked me to come and preside at his funeral services last year, a high honor. Of course, I heard Alan Buzak, Dr. Patricia Gould Champ, Dr. Arlene Chern, Dr. Renita Weems, and Dr. Charles Booth, Dr. Gina Stewart. My exposure to an experience of black preaching and black preachers of ever widening theolo theological stripes, seminary trained and no seminary training, was giving me an education about assimilation, indoctrination, and orientation that was invaluable. Inscrutable at times, but invaluable nevertheless. In the fifth decade of my experience straddling the academy and the sanctuary straddling the academic podium and the free church pulpit, I saw the split between Steve Biko supporters and New Bentley drivers. Black clergy concerned about the poor and black preachers desiring to be somebody's bishop. I saw that rift widen almost along the same fault lines that Eugene Robinson describes in his book, The Disintegration of Black America. How many of you have read, read that? You need to pick that up. When he talks about the four black Americas that are in existence today, where the black America that we think we know has disintegrated and is now splintered into four different black Americas. The super rich who don't go to church or care nothing about church. The wannabes who try to pretend like they're the super rich. The hopelessly poor, whom the wannabes and the super rich don't care anything at all about and don't want them in church when they go to church. And the Africans, who are 
expatriates. They've been here 15, 20, 25 years who are part of the black community who are raising the question with us in our black churches, how come my kids aren't available for scholarships? When I went to Lincoln University to speak at graduation several years ago, both the valedictorian and the salutatorian were Nigerian women who see themselves and consider themselves African expatriates living in America. Almost along those same fault lines, uh, Robinson argues, I have seen along those same almost, the impact of the media and TV ministries. I've seen media and TV ministries on tele splinter the black church into more than four different black churches. Praise and worship, social justice, openly open and affirming, openly homophobic, prosperity only, fixation on soul saving, fixation on mega sizing at multiple locations, metropolitan ranches, that's what Joe Samuel Ratliff calls them. You no longer have the image of the pastor as a shepherd, the pastor is now a rancher. He sends out Hoss and Lil John to take care of the, the flood. He's the rancher. Rural family churches. Many days it feels like we are in the Mark V season of the black church. Our name is Legion. There are so many of us. And the demonic metaphor hits painfully close to home in far too many instances. And in that fifth decade, 47 to 57, I heard a disturbing variety of black preaching, much of which is eons removed from the Virginia Union University prism through which I learned and through which I viewed substantive black preaching, which was and is faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Consider the complexity during my fifth and sixth decades. I heard Charles Walker, 19th Street Baptist, Philadelphia. I heard Frank Madison Reed. I heard Bishop Lewis H. Ford. I heard Joe Samuel Ratliff. I heard Otis Moss Jr. and Otis Moss III. I heard James Perkins. I heard Johnny Ray Youngblood. I heard Bishop Nathaniel Jarrett. I heard Bishop Dennis Robinson. I heard Dr. Jessica Ingram. In the sixth decade, 58 to 68, and in the seventh decade, on the one hand, there's good news. I've heard Dion Boissier. I've heard Leslie Callahan. I've heard Jerry Carter. And I've heard the wisdom of my oldest grandson. Mm -hmm. Now that's the goodness, good news. When he was a senior in high school, sidebar, he is now in his last semester and will graduate from Yale Divinity School and then the Yale Institute of Sacred Music with the two degrees in May. But when he was a senior in high school, he was in my car, I was taking him to the youth revival, the last night of the youth revival. Now, for the youth revival, one of the things I recognized many, many years ago that as I got older, I needed young ministers who could relate to the young people because they speak the language of the young people. They, they know hip hop. I was in Los Angeles, California, team, team tag preaching with Freddie Haynes. Uh, just as an example why I know I need younger pastors. Freddie Haynes was preaching about Abraham and the vision that God gave him and Abraham trying to make Eleazar his servant, the son. And God saying, no, no, that's not going to be your son. He said, well, you know, why, why not? And God took him out of the tent and showed him the stars and said, you see those stars? You're going to have more. You and Sarah are going to have more children than that. Just be faithful to what I tell you to do. And Freddie's point and structure of his sermon was that what men need. The night before that, he preached on what women need. And on his what men need, he, his first point was they need a pause. Second point was they need their props. Give, stop telling your husband how good the preacher is and they'll never give your husband no props. <laughs> and the third P was, he didn't say P, he said Abraham went back in that tent. <laughs> and he told Sarah, put on your Fredericks of Egypt with them Ethiopian junk in the trunk. I ain't got no Viagra, but God gave me a vision. I want you to back that. And when he said back that thing up, 
<laughs> All the young people started screaming. I took my pen out and wrote a note. <laughs> Gotta go look this up. And I went, our hotel was on the edge of a mall. I went to the mall the next morning to the music store. I said, do you all have a record or CD? Uh, use, a, use a fine mammy jammer, won't you back that thing? <laughs> and the guy said, you want the radio version or the real version? <laughs> so give me the real version. <laughs> I went up to my room and put it in my computer and then I called my daughter, because my oldest daughter is aficionado of hip hop. She knows hip hop. I said, Daddy, look, last night Freddie said, use a fine, mm -hmm, back that. And I put on, she said, Daddy, we played that for you last summer. I said, well, after so many MF, you stopped listening. You know? <laughs> but I would get young ministers because they could speak that language that the young people knew. Just like last night, you heard some tittering laughter in the, in the audience when I said, kids, mamas and daddies, they don't listen to Amazing Grace. They're listening to, oh my God. Look at her. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would get young preachers. I know that's, 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 that's young people, I know. <laughs> I would get young preachers to preach because the kids like the young preachers. And on the way to the last night of revival, my grandson, a senior in high school, says to me, Granddaddy, how come Reverend calls a man's name does not have any social content in his preaching whatsoever? I said, I don't know. He said, you never asked him? <laughs> I said, no. He said, I'm going to ask him. Now he's a 17-year-old senior in high school. He said, I'm going to ask him. I said, go right ahead. <laughs> that night, on the way home, he didn't, he didn't say anything to me. I waited a week. He still didn't say anything to me. So I said, Jay, did you ask Reverend what you said you were going to ask him? Yep. I said, what did he say? He said, he told me that was not his gift. <laughs> I said, how do you respond to that? He's 17 years old. He said, Daddy, Uncle Freddie, Frederick Douglass Haynes, has a gift. He can write out his whole sermon, longhand, put it on his PDA, get up in the pulpit, look at it, review it, put his PDA away and say it word for word. Mm -hmm. Just like actors every week have to learn new lines to tell them. He said, that's a gift to have that kind of memory. He said, Uncle Rudy, he was talking about Rudolph McKissick. He said, Uncle Rudy was a music major in college, voice and organ. He knows exactly what key he gonna hoop in. <laughs> and when he gets to the end of his sermons, he'll hold up three fingers for three flats. We starting, we starting four fingers for four flats. We starting in A flat and working up to C. Perfect pitch. He said, "That's a gift." To me, social content in the message is not a gift. It's a given. How do you follow in the footsteps of him who says, I behold, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and talk about that's not your gift. Mm. To me, that's the bright news because young persons like that who have that kind of consciousness and understanding of what the preaching the gospel is, is a sign of hope for me. On the other hand, there is the challenging news that Raphael Warnock writes about his observation in the divided mind of the black church that we quote Jim Cohn, but we channel Billy Graham. Oh. And the equally challenging news, on the other hand, is the megachurch preaching, which is neither pastoral or prophetic, just popular, with a fixation on two and three locations. Dr. Kenyatta Gilbert is very helpful for those of you in, in seminary, if you have not looked at his work in terms of the threefold nature of the pastoral office, which is prophetic, priestly, and sagely, elderly wisdom, priestly preaching, as well as prophetic. The challenge, on the other hand, of an assimilated theology where we have forgotten or lost Dr. King's critique of April 4th, 1967, preached from the Riverside Church about the three-headed demon in our times, racism, militarism, and casino capitalism, where we have moved from Gordon Blaine Hancock's critique of capitalism in the 1930s with the double duty dollar 
to an unashamed embrace of capitalism with women preachers moving from concerns about dedication and integrity to being concerned about being divas and celebrity. Where we have moved from male preachers being more concerned about jewelry than justice. Where we have moved from a position where they were fighting for the freedom of South Africans to a position where they're fascinated with self-aggrandizement. Prosperity ignores the poor. Dr. R. Drew Smith, many years ago, I think it was 690, 1998, did a two volume work, New Day Begun and Long March Ahead. And then he edited that book. What he did was interview 20 different, 10 chapters each book, 20 different church persons, women and men of the gospel in all kinds of occupations, preaching, teaching, counseling, asking primarily this central question, where is the black church 30 years after James Cone's black power, black radical? Where is the black church 30 years, 68, 98, after King's assassination? And overwhelmingly, the answer was the black church in the days of Martin Luther King confronted an evil government. Mm -hmm. And 30 years later, the black church cooperates okay. with an evil government. But the challenging news in the area of black preaching cannot put out the flame of hope that I see burning in the hearts of this present age of seminarians who have a passion for justice, for mercy, and who are determined to walk where God is walking. I thank Alan Buzak for that insight and his tenderness of conscience. Have you all seen Dr. Buzak, or has he done in, in any of his classes, covered for you what it means to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? To walk humbly with your God. Ask the people at your church. They'll say that means you ought not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Always take the low road, be humble. No, it means to walk humbly where God is walking okay. today. Yes. Which for me brings new meaning to the song and you can join me in singing it. Where he leads me I will follow. Walk humbly with God. Where he leads me I will follow where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him with him oh. eternal God take these who prepare themselves for preaching in your church make them and mold them as you would have them after your will, that they may walk with you in the uncomfortable places that you walk today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, and all the people of God together will say, Amen. Amen.